Raise out your right hand, if you would, please. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Beyond this sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. What we pray for ourselves, Lord, we pray for the class checked in here in Tarpon Springs, Florida, in the USA. Those watching by television, the internet, or receiving the message in some other way. Holy Spirit, as the porter who opens the door, you alone can open Christ so that he comes to us, the sheep, and ministers to us. This is a special time of your word. There's no manipulation. There's no antics. It's your word. Let us hear from heaven by the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The friend of the bridegroom, known in Jewish circles as the Shushpin, we would call him the best man at the wedding. But at a Jewish wedding, he's known as the Shushbin. You see it there. But if you're going by the spelling, it looks like it's Shoshben. S-H-O-S-H-B-E-N. But the pronunciation is Shushbin. The friend of the bridegroom, better known as the best man. Then your notes say this, and we'll come to the reading in a moment or two. Who am I? I ask you this question, who are you? A speck of dust in this vast universe, who are you? You have to answer that. Who am I? I'm Leslie Hale, sometimes known as the Irish preacher. I am a man. I am a part of the human family. I am mortal. I am finite. Who am I? I am a husband to Mooring and a brother to Doring and Ella. I am a daddy to Ruth Ann and Leslie and LaDonna. Who am I? I'm a grandfather to five wonderful grandchildren who call me Parker as a pet name. Ryan and Kyle and Zoe and Megan and Connor. Who am I? To you, I am a domata. Who am I? I'm an American, though I was born in Ireland because some years ago we received our citizenship papers and we're proud to be an American. But above all that list, there's something else that I am that's thrilling, exhilarating, staggering, mind-boggling. And I want you to listen carefully to what I'm about to say that I am. Above all those wonderful things on that list, I am also, are you listening? I am also a friend of the bridegroom. A friend of the bridegroom. I've told you this several times, so I'll spend little time on it here, just to set the record straight, and for those that haven't heard before, I never wanted to be a preacher, ever. I wanted to be a soccer player, and I was for a certain period of my young life, and then go into business. My picture of a preacher was somebody that I could see in Ireland with a long black robe and a collar going the wrong way. And even though from time to time my mother would pull me to her side and put her hand through my hair and say, one day you'll be a preacher, and she never overdid that when I was very young, but she did it from time to time. And I didn't want to hurt her and say, I don't want to be a preacher, because that picture of who a preacher was was in my mind, and I thought it was very sissy -ish. So I didn't want to be a preacher ever, but didn't want to say that to her. And after God called me to be a preacher, through my mother's prayers and through the Holy Spirit, just like Timothy through his mother and his grandmother, according to Paul. After God called me, and I was to be a preacher, even though I never wanted to be, 
then I had to wrestle with some things to make it come to pass. It's not that I don't want to be a preacher in the sense of disobedience. The preaching bit has nothing to do with it. Standing on the platform or sitting up here or behind a microphone or on television means absolutely zero. I couldn't care less about any of those things. I did have a panting desire, even as a young person, to love God and to know God. To get to know the king, not just what's on the king's table, but to get to know the king himself. I wanted that, and I found out that part of what he wanted was to be a preacher. So fine, I can live with that. That's just perfectly fine. But the thrill is not in standing before people. The thrill is in obeying God. However, that feeling of not caring about the platform or the microphone or nowadays about television or the Internet or whatever has always been pronounced, but it was very pronounced at the beginning of our ministry. In fact, several times when I was to speak at a meeting, I would arrive and look around and see if I could see another preacher who was in the congregation, and I would go before the service and coax him to speak instead of me. In fact, my big sister Ella talked to me about that more than once when I was very young and told me to cut out that nonsense. But that's what I used to do. I felt so shy. I felt so embarrassed. In fact, even to this day, believe it or not, a team of wild horses wouldn't get me on the platform other than the call of God. But when I was starting the ministry and I had these same feelings, almost of detachment, and I couldn't reconcile it. How can you want to serve God? He's called you to preach and to teach, and yet you almost feel that you couldn't care less. Now, I did fling myself into the ministry, that's true, but there was a feeling of such, I, I can only use the word detachment, that kind of said then, that says it today, if there's some way that God can get me out of it, that's all right with me. I won't regret it. You say, this is awful strange. I'm just telling you the truth. I didn't know what to do about this desire to serve God and that, this feeling that to go to a meeting and stand up didn't do anything for me at all. So I finally met an Assemblies of God preacher way back there. I was very young. I always remember him very, very well because he had only one eye. And I can still see him looking at me like this, you know. And this thing worried me so much. Worried is the word that I finally asked, could I meet him for coffee? And uh, we were going to go to Belfast Castle overlooking the water where, in fact, Mooring and I had our uh, reception after our wedding. And uh, we went in there for coffee, and this man did meet me. He was much older than I. He already was a preacher for over 30 years at that time, and I was just starting. So there's the old man and the young man. And we sit down, and we talked about several things. And then I finally blurt out this, which was a big deal to me. It was a burden to me. How can it be that I love God, and I say I'll obey God, and I want to obey God, but the thing he wants me to do, I almost couldn't care less about it. Well, I tried to explain it, and I'm sure I didn't do it very well, but I tried to get it out. And when I got through, I said, that's it. I remember sitting at that little table in the little restaurant in Belfast Castle overlooking Belfast Loch, or the water there. When I got through, he didn't say a word. I remember that. I'm sure it was only a moment or two, but at that time it seemed forever. I didn't know if I had to keep on explaining what I was trying to say. And I remember... With that one eye, he stared at me, and he was stirring his coffee, staring and stirring. I didn't know if I was going to be rebuked or told to pray. And finally, he said rather clearly the following words. Leslie said, I've been trying to get there for 30 years. I said, what? He said, I have been trying to get there for 30 years. I said, what do you mean? He said, there's so much of me that wants on the platform. And he says, you're telling me you couldn't care less? I said, I thought I had a problem. No, he says, I have the problem. I repeat that, not to glorify ourselves or to put him down, 
but to make the big differentiation between preaching, the platform, television, or whatever seems to give you publicity more than others. To differentiate all that from this, while I didn't care about that, did I ever have a desire to be a friend of the bridegroom? And I decided as a young man that I would follow the words of that famous book, the title of which is Magnificent Obsession, that I, through this magnificent obsession to get to know him and to get to know him personally, and then in his calling to make him known to others and to shed light upon his word, and I have spent, how long is that now? Fifty years, I suppose, trying to get to know him and to become a friend of the bridegroom. It says about Abraham, he was called the friend of God. It's good to have friends, but it's fabulous to be a friend of God, which I am and which you are, and which you can be as well if you're not already. I wanted to say all that to tell you primarily who I am. All those other things are nice and important, but they're nothing in comparison to this. We're numbered among his friends. The God of the universe, the God that Gail sang about so beautifully, this God, our Redeemer, I'm his friend. I am his friend. And as the song says, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. John the Baptist used this term. Shushman. I am a paranymph. We'll come to that also. I am a friend. Most people, and I touched on this last Wednesday night, don't really understand the gospel at all. Even people who go to church regularly, they have got such a twisted view of God. The message is grace. The message is God's love. Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. God's not trying to show off how perfect he is by pointing out every moment how imperfect you are. God's trying to develop a relationship with you whereby you become his friend every day and every hour and every minute. And you know that he's got the reins of your life, that he is in control, and regardless of terrible circumstances, all is well. John's the Baptist. John the Baptist is the one who launched that. And I'd like to talk a little bit about him before we examine a little further what does it mean to have, as the little old hymn used to say, friendship with Jesus, fellowship divine. Oh, what blessed sweet communion. Jesus is a friend of mine. Not my condemner, not the one who points out my faults and my failings, which I have in abundance, but my friend, my friend, full of mercy and full of love and full of understanding for me. Remember, he loves me non-judgmentally. He loves you that way. And some people live for 50 years before they finally get the truth. He loves me non-judgmentally. It's not because of my performance. It's because of his nature. And he wants to be your friend on that basis. Some people just want to preach about this standard and that standard and the other standard, and they're killing people. The letter kills. It's the spirit that gives life. That's the setting. Here's the story. You who are watching, you can turn to John 3, verses 22 through 36. We may not get reading at all, of course. You don't have to turn to it here. Uh, the class that's checked in, you can look at it in your notes because we have it printed out for you. So let's learn a few things as we build up toward this friend of the bridegroom. I want you to be a friend of the bridegroom, and I want you to have the capacity to hear his voice now look at me for another minute and to be able to decipher between God's voice and your own voice and the devil's voice and the enemy's vo your enemy's voice and even your friend's voice. You've got to get to know God's voice. He's your friend. I understand what he's saying. Both through his word and by the spirit. John 3, 22. After these things came Jesus and his 
disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. Look this way. You'll have to go back and forward. It says Jesus baptized. It's further explained in chapter 4. There was a lot of baptism, but not by Jesus personally. It was his a short, a small amount of disciples that he had at this time as his ministry was starting. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there. It was called the place of seven fountains. And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Look this way. John is about to be cast into prison. His ministry is over at that point. Jesus is just arriving to start to preach. But for a very short period, their ministries overlap. It's not for very long, and they are very similar. They both have disciples. They both preach repentance. They both talk about water baptism. It's very, very similar, and they overlap. And then on top of all that, where Jesus starts to do this is in the same neighborhood as where John has been carrying on his ministry. I don't know the exact miles, but it wasn't far down the road in an overlapping situation. Let's read on. Verse 24, For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Look this way. What do you mean? Well, some fellow comes up to uh, John's disciples. John had a lot of disciples and followers and learners. And he said uh, something like this, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh, there's some things I want to know. It's about this business of you baptize with water. That, that's symbolically purifying. We believe in water purification too, the Jews said. Only we do it differently. We don't pe put people under the water. What we do is we wash our hands and we wash our feet and we wash all of us and we wash the pots and the pans. But there's a similarity because it's cleansing through water. But wait a minute, there's a problem here. Because if we have got that and you've got that, then why do you need competition? Well, what do you mean competition? Don't you hear about this fellow up the road? Who is this man? He, he's coming along too, and he's got his own baptism as well. And the baptism of Jesus and the baptism of John the Baptist was not the full believer's baptism which we have today. This was a baptism unto repentance, and repentance means to change your mind and to look at things in a different way. So the disciples of John are confronted with this situation. What are they going to do in explaining about this baptism? There's the Jewish kind, pots and pans. There's John's kind, but is John's kind different from Jesus' kind? What is going on about this water business? Verse 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about water, or cleansing, or purifying. And so they, John's disciples, came unto John and said unto him, How do we know they were his disciples? Clearly it says, they said unto him, Rabbi, you are our teacher. Meaning we're your disciples. And now you're going to see something which is very powerful, really, and, 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 and not too positive a way. He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, and notice please what it says here, they avoided naming the name of Jesus, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come unto him. Look this way. Do you remember, John, you baptized a lot of people. They had a showdown with John. We've got to talk about this. There's competition in the territory. Do you remember in all the people you baptized, there was one particular one, and you said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. You never did that with anybody else. You said there was a dove and all that. You, oh, gee, uh, John said, Yeah, I, I remember it was Jesus, all right. They wouldn't mention his name. They were jealous. Well, do you know what he's doing? You authenticated him. You told the people that he was sent from God, that he was a great man. And you know what he's done? He has set up a tent, as it were, in our neighborhood. Not literally a tent. I hope you understood that. He sent up a ministry here. He's doing what the same as you're doing. But there's something as awful has happened. Not only are there bigger crowds going to his meetings than to our meetings, but some of your disciples have left you and have become his disciples. The Bible teaches that. What are we going to do about this? I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to say this. One of the banes and curses of the church today is ministerial jealousy. This ministry is bigger than some ministries. It's a lot smaller than other ministries. I couldn't care less. Those 
bigger ministries that are of God. There's some of them that are not of God at all. But those that are of God, I say, hallelujah. God give it to you. Be faithful and God bless you mightily. The same with smaller ministries that shouldn't come into it. But there's some preachers worried sick about this very thing. When we still lived in Ireland, Maureen and I were visiting Dallas, Texas. We were young and raw and we were going to go to a service that night not to speak. But we were going to go. There was another speaker going to be there, another evangelist. And late in the afternoon, I remember while we were there, the pastor met the visiting evangelist for the first time just a few hours before the service. They shook hands, and then the pastor disappeared. He didn't get back to service time. We were all in the church, and he came in. And I always remember, Maureen will probably remember it, he had on the biggest diamond cufflinks that I have ever seen anybody with, ever. Of course, it was Texas, you know, but anyway, it, it, it was just absolutely huge. So he was talking to us, and somebody said, where have you been? And he wasn't laughing. He was dead serious. He said, I went downtown to the jewelers. And they said, what were you doing? He said, I rushed down there. Seriously. He said, did you see that guest evangelist who's going to be on my platform tonight? He said, did you see those huge diamond cufflinks? And I, I, well, I didn't notice cufflinks and didn't need to talk about cufflinks as a subject at all. Well, he said, I have a rule. He said, nobody's going to get in onto my platform looking better than me. And in this instance, we're in bigger cufflinks than me. So he went down. So I went down, he said, and I bought these big ones and I will have a better attention than he will have in the revival for that night. One time when we were in Houston, Texas, God gave us such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a church that seated 5,000 people, and the wife of the song leader phoned a pastor here in Florida. Now, we still lived in Ireland. This is in the 70s. And she talked about this past, to this pastor in Florida in a large church and told him all about the wonderful things that's going on. And just she went on and on about it. I didn't even know about the conversation until we flew to Florida. We were to preach in his church. He called me into the office before the evening service when we were to preach. I was young and raw. We'd had this great revival meeting in Houston. He said, I want to talk to you. He said, my cousin called me and said about this wonderful preaching, this wonderful teaching. I didn't think that. I didn't say that. I knew nothing about it. And I said, well, God richly blessed. And he leaned over, large church, and he pointed at me. He said, I want you to know. He said, I don't believe anybody preaches that good. And anybody that does preach that good is not preaching on my platform tonight. And he wouldn't let me preach. And we didn't preach. That was it. Sometimes jealousy in a preacher's heart is the worst thing that you could have ever met. And here John's people were gripped by it. They said he's got bigger crowds. You authenticated him, meaning you shouldn't have done it. He's baptizing like you. He's copying you. Only he's better at it because you get all these miracles. All kinds of things are happening. What are you doing? Put John on the spot. Do you get the feeling of this story as we enter into it? This is what happened. And to prove it again, I want to go back there to uh, verse 26. But let's rush on. They came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness. You certified him. You said he was okay. And I put in a note. Uh, notice how they wouldn't even mention his name. They just referred to him as the one that was with thee beyond Jordan. Behold. That word means look with wonder. Can you believe it? He's baptizing just like you are, but there's a problem. All men come to him. He's got a bigger crowd than we have. Huh. John, bless his heart. Thank God for such a spirit. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except that be given him from heaven. If God is blessing him, he wasn't talking about false things, but if God is blessing him, how can I fight it? I don't want to fight it. I want to rejoice in it. Verse 28, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Listen, everybody. Find out what your calling is and then wear the coat that fits you. Don't wear one that's too small, but don't try one that's too big. John knew the coat that fitted him, and he was carrying it out. He said, I, uh, where was I at? Verse 28, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. I was sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, and I'm not jealous. But what am I? 
I am the best man at the wedding. I am the friend of the bridegroom. In the Greek, it's paranymph. You know, a nymph is a beautiful girl, like a Greek goddess or a Roman goddess. He said, I'm a friend of the bride because I'm going to bring her together with the bridegroom. I, I'm the one that does that. I'm the best man. The best man today at the wedding is not as good as the shush bin back there, the friend of the bridegroom. But it gives us an idea of what we're talking about. And we'll enlarge it in just a moment. I am the friend of the bridegroom, listen, which standeth, it doesn't mean, hangs around, doesn't mean hanging around, it means standing to attention. I'm listening, I'm waiting, and I hear him. And I rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, therefore, my joy is fulfilled because he must increase and I must decrease. Isn't that a tremendous attitude to have in the ministry? To be able to acknowledge the, the blessings of others when you're so free that you can thank God for others who seem to be more blessed than you, then you're a big man. You're a big lady. That's a wonderful thing to do. This was John's absolutely marvelous attitude. And he said, what I want is to be a friend of the bridegroom. I am a friend of the bridegroom. And I stand and I wait for his voice. And I'll make you a deal. If you pray and be faithful and prepare and come here each Sunday morning, and now I throw in Wednesday night too, I'll do my best to stay in the spiritual kitchen all week so that when I come here on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening, when I speak it will be thus and thus saith the Lord so that you can hear His voice. Because we live in a world where there's a whole lot of voices leading the multitudes astray. And you know what people are like. There's only shepherds and sheep. There's only leaders and followers. If you're a follower, I'm not putting you down when I call you a sheep. But you must remember what a sheep is. If there's a whole bunch of sheep and one gets to the edge of the precipice and falls over, you would think the other ones would say, no, I'm smart, I'm not going to fall over. But no, here comes number two. He falls over too. And number three falls over and on they go. You need guidance. You need to hear his voice. Have you heard his voice? Your eternal soul depends on on hearing what God is saying. Your soul depends on your family, your blessing, because your life is a rock thrown in the water and the ripples will affect generations. And it all depends on the voices that you're listening to. I spoke to a man yesterday, a wonderful, clever, brilliant, educated man who had such a wrong understanding of Jesus because he went into the philosophizing about Jesus and away, got away down a side road. What voice are you listening to? Because everything depends on it. He said, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. And you know what my job is? Not to please myself, not to get the bride, not to get the preeminence. In fact, the more preeminence he gets, the better I like it. Because he's going to increase more and more and I'm going to decrease more and more. Well, what are you doing, John the Baptist? I'm hanging around here and my ears are wide open. Why? Because as a friend of the bridegroom, I'm listening for his word. What is he saying to me? It's not, friends, just what the preacher says. You may be listening to a false prophet. It's not what the church says or your church. It may be a false church. I don't know. It's what does the Lord say. He said, I want to know what the bridegroom says. And once he says it, it's not a case of, well, why did you say that? Or argue about it or fight about it. It simply is... When he says jump, all you say is, ha, hi, sir. Yes, sir. And you carry out the voice of the bridegroom. Most people are not hearing God's voice because they don't get it from the Word and therefore their hearts are not free and clear to get it by the Spirit applying the Word. The purpose of this service is to teach all of us how to be tuned in to the voice of the bridegroom and become his close friend and confident and one that he can depend on on giving us orders through the Word and the Spirit so that we will carry them out as a part of his great overall work in the kingdom. That's the purpose of this service. Go ahead and praise him if you will. He said, I stand by and I hear him. And that is in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what verse is it? 29. I stand and hear him and I rejoice greatly because of his what? His voice. I'm his friend. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. Why? Because he must increase and I must decrease. Can you say that about Jesus in your life? Give me a wave if you can. He must increase. We must decrease. 
I am as nothing. I told you earlier, I am a member of the human race. That means I'm mortal and I'm finite. The important thing is, we are friends of the bridegroom who have arrived at a point where we know his voice. You watch Christian television and you know what's from God and what's garbage. You know it when you get close to the bridegroom and then your joy is fulfilled. I want you to jump to the next page, if you would. And I want to tell you five things about the shushman, the best man. If we have time, we'll come back. But can I get a little indication we are together so far? Yeah. Building up to something here. Friendship with the bridegroom by understanding his voice and carrying it out. But we go now to what is number seven, skipping over several notes, and it says five things about the shushbin. I'm correctly pronouncing it, even though it looks like shushbin. Number one, he does what the bridegroom orders. He stands ready to carry out God's word. Look this way. I already told you about it. You're tired of hearing of it. I was shy. I couldn't sing, etc., etc. But he called me to the ministry. He said, give up soccer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's it. No question. Don't argue with God. If you argue with God for a year or two years or five years, you're going to be miserable. You're going to get nowhere. You say, yes, sir. I surprised some of these fellows back here in the green room this morning. I told them something. One of them said, I don't believe it. But it was true anyway. In my younger days, I took a course in carpentry. <laughs> Why did you laugh? <laughs> You're like Robert. You didn't believe it either. And here's the basic thing I learned, probably the only thing I learned, that you plane with the grain. Isn't that right? If you plane against the grain, what happens? <coughs> Won't work. But when you plane with the grain, it flows. It flows. When you say, yes, sir, in spite of battles and difficulties, you will start to flow with God. You will be able, to determine in, be able to determine in your heart the way God's moving, and you'll be able to move with God. You will know that you're supposed to be in Tarpon Springs. You will know you're supposed to be on television and the Internet. You will know what you're doing is the right thing to do. You won't be living in a fog and dying in a mist. You will know, know, know things. You will know it. Why? Because in spite of difficulties, there will be a certain flow. That's not often I give people the benefit of my carpentry information, but I just did it to you because I like you. <laughs> Flow. Have you got it? It's an awful thing to be fighting God, even if you're still saved, you know, but uh, 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 don't do that. Flow. Yes, sir. So what does the bridegroom do? Excuse me, what does the sh shush bin do? He stands and he hears the voice of the bridegroom and he does it. No questions asked. Period. Number two, the bridegroom must increase. Amen to that. The shoespin must decrease. Now look at me. The worst thing in the world, then I'm going to get off this, is human pride. Have you ever seen human pride in operation? Here's a whole bunch of us. We're all, there's millions of us, you know. We've all got a head and ears and arms and legs. We walk down the street. We're all bits of clay. But here's one other bit of clay. And they think that they look a little nicer than all the rest of us. It looks so stupid. <laughs> Arrogance and pride of ourselves looks so silly. I'm telling you, friends, you're a piece of clay. The only thing that's valued there is the grace of God. Don't mind it a bit if you're put into the, the background seemingly. You know what it says in the Old Testament about the servant of God? It says he hid himself with the Lord, and then he went out and showed himself unto Israel. He hid and then showed himself unto Israel. You know what other people do? They show themselves, and then they got to go and hide themselves. Show themselves too prematurely. God give us humbleness, and not humbleness that we're proud of, because that cancels it out. Like the fellow that was so humble, they give him a decoration around his neck, a medallion, and then they took it off him when he wore it. We have to decrease. It doesn't mean we become sniveling idiots, but we recognize in ourselves we're nothing, and He is everything. Say amen to it. 
let the people around the world hear you saying amen. amen. Nine, number three, what's he do? He brings the bride and the bridegroom together. He's not jealous of that. Look this way. You know what my job is as a friend of the bridegroom? To bring you, the bride of Christ, or part of the bride of Christ, together with him. I want you to have a relationship. Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, I dedicated you as a chaste, pure virgin before God. I want you to have a beautiful relationship with him. Do you think I'm going to get jealous when you love Jesus more than you love me? I've learned this, friends. When you love Jesus first, you can love what is that person doing there? Oh, you're, I thought he was sleeping. P put your leg in a bit, would you? That's distracting me. Thank you. I am not one bit jealous of such a thing. How absurd. Let me pick up that point again. What is my job? Listen to it. Listen to it. It's not to think, and I've never done this in my life. Well, they're coming to church this morning. You know, I hope so-and-so comes because we might get a big offering. It doesn't cross your mind. Well, I hope this because the word will get out. We're good at this. We're good at that. We're good at that. It doesn't come across your mind. I have a burning desire as a friend of the bridegroom to bring you and the bridegroom together in a relationship of intimacy through my inauguration of that thing as his friend to introduce you to Him more and more and more and more so that you two end up with a very close, intimate relationship where you know Him Amen. and you hear His voice. Amen. You hear His voice. You've got to hear His voice. You've got to hear His voice, whether it's from this Word or by the Spirit in your heart, because you can be misled. But then there's something else. Number four, He guards the marriage suite from intruders, no false lovers. Look this way. At the Jewish wedding, the celebrations go on for about a week. And then what they would have when the bridal chamber was ready for the consummation of the marriage, the first person would come would be the bride, and she would arrive in the dark, and she would be in there. We don't need to go into all kinds of details. You're adults, you know, about these things. She went in there, the door was closed. But in case some false lover came by, and try to break down the door to get in toward that beautiful girl. What did the shushman do? He stood guard outside and made sure that no false lovers would get near the bride. And then when the bridegroom came and he heard the celebration of the bridegroom coming and heard his voice, he got very excited. He stepped aside, opened the door, the bridegroom went in, the marriage was consummated, and the thrill in the heart of the shoesmen could hardly be described because his work was now complete. He had brought them both together in intimacy. You know what part of my job is? You mightn't even want me to do this. I'm going to do it anyway as long as you come under this roof. I'm going to do my best to guard you from false lovers, from people on television who try to skin money off you and they're teaching you wrong stuff. There's all kinds of wrong stuff out there. I think, I think of the National Council of Churches. Have you ever heard of that gang? the World Council of Churches, you want to know whether you're right or wrong in a certain matter? Find out what the World Council of Churches is thinking or the National Council of Churches and what they're thinking, you will know the opposite is the right thing. If they're opposing you, you're in the right. There's false lovers. There's people coming at you. There's false cults. There's people coming to tell you this and to tell you this and to tell you this. What is my job? It's to guard you. Sometimes you mightn't like it because I'm too specific about warning you about TV preachers and others. I'm not trying to put on anybody. I'm trying to guard the bridal chamber Amen. so that the bride and the bridegroom have intimacy, not with some intruder who broke into your life and leads you astray. Maybe up to this time you have been led astray because you've listened to a wrong voice. And maybe your mother told you wrong or your father or your grandparents and they didn't know any better. But because they didn't know doesn't mean that you shouldn't know. Is it all right for me to guard your intimate relationship with Christ? Is that all right for me to do that? I'm going to do it anyway. 
Number five, he's thrilled at the voice of the bridegroom. And number six, he gets fulfilled with the joy of doing all these things for the bridegroom. Let me go a little further. 1 Kings 19, 11 and 12. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount of the Lord, before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, now get this, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. Remember a few years ago, there's always, there's always something new coming by. We have a rule around here. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. A few years ago, you remember there was this enforced so-called laughing revival. It was pathetic. And do you know when I took a stand against it on television, do you know what people said about me in opposition? They said, oh, the only thing he has against it, I remember this well, the only thing he has against it is it's not in the Bible. You read about Jesus crying. You don't read about Jesus laughing. It doesn't mean we can't laugh, but to induce laughter. I mean, if everybody laughs like you just laughed there, we're not talking about that. That inducing laughter as a show of the flesh was an absolute disaster. Why? Because men want to come to the church. Men and women want to come to the church to be entertained. You'll get more people if you entertain them, whether it's through the earthquake or the wind or the fire. If you've got something to get the noise going and the emotion going and the adrenaline going and the psychology going. But it says all those things, God was not in them. He was in the still, small voice. I want you to know the voice. Now, when the voice comes, there's joy and there's blessing. It depends on which follows which. If we're trying to induce something, that's wrong. When God speaks to us, we can leap for joy. That's a different thing entirely. But those other big things of demonstration were getting nowhere, for the Bible distinctly says God was not in the earthquake, God was not in the wind, God was not in the fire. And when all that calmed down, he heard a still, small voice. You don't come here to be entertained. You come here to be taught and once in a while rebuked. Rebuked. To be told to get in line and don't be afraid of that. Why? So that you can hear the still small voice. And some people are too busy in God's work and there's too much noise going on in their lives to get calm to hear His voice. Amen. My job is to help you to hear His voice through His Word preached, through the Word that you read, and through the inner voice. Look what it says in Isaiah 66 verse 6. Now this is very powerful here. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, and a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. Isaiah 66, 6. Now you surely can remember that verse. 66, 6. And what's it say? There's three different kinds of voices coming at you. What are they? A voice from the city. That's the industrial, commercialized world we live in. Voices, voices, voices. Everybody's talking to us. And then it says, there's a voice from the temple. That's religious voices. Religion, religion, religion. Well, you might say, well, what should I do when I watch Christian television or when I come to hear you or anybody else? You should be cautiously skeptical. I don't mean in an angry way that you won't have your ears open. But be like the Bereans. They search the scriptures daily to see if these things be so. If we don't feed your soul, you shouldn't even come here. And there's voices that are commercial pulling you that way. There's voices that are religious pulling you that way. What voice are you listening to? But it says here, after the voice of the noise of the city and after the voice from the temple or religion, then there was the voice of the Lord. Question, are your ears so full from the city and from religion that you've never yet heard the voice of God? Can you discern? Do you know who you are and what you're doing? Do you know what way you're heading? Are you doing what's right before the Lord regarding His Word so that when your rock goes into the pond and the ripples go out, your family's going to be affected because you've heard His voice. Amen. You can't really be His friend in an intimate way the way you want to be until you start to know His voice. 
It says, my sheep know my voice. I've told you before, I don't know if that's a put down of the lambs. But it doesn't say the lambs know my voice. Maybe it's because we need to develop and to get to know his voice. And I can tell you some things, friend, far from perfect, though we are around here, we're obeying his will in this ministry. We're obeying God. We're obeying God. I have a constant witness in my spirit from the Holy Spirit saying to me, Son, you're in the center of my will. You're in the center of my will. He never yet told me you're perfect. You're doing it perfect. No, no, no. He said, if your eye be single, your whole body is full of light. That is, your, if your motive is pure, your actions are accepted by God, even if you make a mess of it half the time. You, you learn and improve by experience. But he doesn't judge by that. He judges by the motive. If your eye is single, your whole body is accepted before God. He keeps telling me, you're in the center of my will. I'm not stumbling around here. I'm not wondering. Do you not think that I know after living all this long? I'm as old as dirt now. Do you not know that I know a few things, how to get a bigger crowd, how to entertain, how to press a few buttons and rent a crowd? I'm not going to do it. We're going to keep it pure. Why? Because I'm going to guard the bridal suite. I'm going to guard you to do what? To make sure it's you and the bridegroom get together, become friends, and you know his voice and you know his word. Go ahead and praise him. And praise him again. There are tricky, disastrous, disastrous voices coming at you all the time from the commercial world and from the temple. John 10, 1 through 5. Verily, verily, I say unto you, are you reading it there with me? He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. That's what it is today. We're not coming through Christ. We're coming, climbing up through some other way. Martin Luther, he called it the, the glory ladder. People want to do things that they think glorious to, to get with God. Nowadays, the glory ladder is money. Used to be you got to God through the blood. Now it's through money. It's, it's the money ladder. He said they're climbing up some other way. There is no other way. The same as a thief and a robber. Now you might call him the Pope. Or you might call him your big preacher. The Bible might call him a thief and a robber. What are you doing saying a thing like that? I'm trying to guard the bridal chamber. That is the quiet place between you and God to have fellowship together. We're going deeper with God. Is that all right, friends? That's what we're doing, going deeper with Him. But he that entereth by the door, it's the Spirit that reveals the shepherd, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, the Spirit openeth. And the sheep, what? They hear his voice. I've told you this before. If there's behind me, there's 12 ladies and all say, Leslie, I'll know Maureen's voice. Why? Because we've been together all these years. I know her voice. There's a lot of voices coming at us. It's great to know his word, his voice. But here's what it says. He calleth his own sheep by name. All right, now, wait a minute. Do you mean that? Let me pick somebody over here. Gil, you're a good one. And you too, uh, Steve and Jim. And you, Don, back there. He called you by name. Your name is written in the palm of his hand. He doesn't want to have a long-distance relationship. Sometimes you hear, you know, about a husband and wife or even boyfriend and girlfriend, and they get separated over the miles, one's in one country, one's in another country, and they continue the relationship, you know, long-distance, email or, or phone or something. God does not want a long-distance relationship. And the biggest curse to it is religiosity that made you feel too sinful and too awful to ever have this kind of friendship with Jesus. Get rid of all that garbage. You are the redeemed of the Lord. He loves you, He washed you, and He wants to have a happy, ongoing, excited, thrilling relationship with you to the point where He knows you so personally. He calls you by name. Leslie, Leslie, my middle name is Samuel. Doesn't it make you think in the Bible of those words to a little fellow? Samuel, Samuel. If he doesn't always call you by that audible name, he knows your name. And then what does it say? He leads them out. And when they put, when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Question, do you know his voice? And a stranger will they not follow? I hope you're not following a, strange, a stranger in a strange voice. 
wow, this is a bit rough what I, I'm going to say now. This is a bit rough. I hope spiritually you are not, after what I've done, what I'm trying to do. I hope you're not in the bridal chamber in bed with a false lover instead of with the bridegroom. I can't be any more to the point than that, can I? They will not follow the voice of a stranger. We need to get more sense than follow a lot of the stuff that goes on. They'll flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. John 10, 26, 27. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Number five is John 12, 28 through 30. This is very sad. Father, glorify thy name, Jesus said. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Can you imagine this? Look this way. Some fellow goes home one day. Uh, where were you? The wife says, Well, there's some healer or teacher out there. And when he was there, I was trying to listen to him, and there was a clap of thunder, and I never heard much else. He couldn't discern between a clap of thunder and the voice of God. He said, What? He said, It was just thunder. Who spoke? No, one, no nobody spoke. It was just thunder. Look this way. We're almost through. We'll have to be. Do you know his voice? Do you know his voice? Here's a retired Nazarene pastor over here. Brother Dale, is it not true the most important thing in this world of a million voices, including false religious voices, is it not true, Dale, to hear his voice? It's his voice. It's his word. It's his word. Since you've come here, whether it's a month or six months, have you felt tricked regarding this word? Have you felt manipulated regarding this word? We have sought to give you a pure word because it's my job to guard the bridal chamber. I don't want you in bed with a false lover and feeling it's great and be on your way to hell. This fellow comes home. Well, what, what happened to you? Oh, nothing much happened to me today. Well, what, what happened? Oh, some fellow down there is teaching. But I didn't hear everything he said because of the clap of thunder and... I come on home. Fools are we and blind. We don't know the things that are good for our welfare, Jesus said. One other fellow, he got more spiritual. He said, it's an angel that spoke. Even he was mixed up. It was God speaking. Do you hear God speaking to you? Do you hear God speaking to you? Jesus said, it's the voice which came not because of me, but for your sakes. Then it says, and we'll rush on through Abraham was a friend of God. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7, Art not thou our God who did strive out the inhabitants of this land before the people Israel and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? Look back this way, and I promise I won't be much longer, but look this way. Well, if Abraham is called God's friend, God is so pure, Abraham must have been perfect. <laughs> He did what was wrong. He lied. No, we're not glorifying those things, and neither did he. And we're not telling you to go out and do things deliberately wrong. We're trying to show you God knows your limitations, and he still wants a relationship with you. And that's what happened to Abraham. Abraham was Abraham, far from perfect. From Iraq, he was an Iraqi. He was not a Jew, he was a Gentile, but he was an Iraqi. Isaiah 41, 8 through 10, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. God boasts about this man who blew it, who got mixed up, who sinned, who went in unto Hagar and did what was wrong. After a while, he knew all that he had done wrong, and he was sorry about it. But God Almighty calls him his friend. When are we God's friends? When we're trusting Him, got saved, and we're trusting Him. Are you a friend of the bridegroom this morning? Wave at me. Come on, everybody in the house, wave at me. You give me a little wave also. We're friends of the bridegroom. James 2, 23, I left out some of that verse there. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called 
the friend of God. Oh, 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 oh. What have we got here as we close? We've got more light on the subject about friendship with Jesus. Fellowship divine. Oh, what blessed sweet communion. Jesus is a friend of mine. James 2.23, more light on it than the New Testament. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, I want a scripture that's been fulfilled. What does it say? Abraham was perfect, therefore he was God's friend. No. Abraham, what does it say? Believed. He trusted. He was growing, ever growing. But he trusted God. And that trust got him what? Imputed, imparted righteousness, which is what? Dikeusene. Did you ever hear that word before? And because of that relationship, he was called God's friend. Go down to number 12 there. Leave another lot. Proverbs 18, 24. The man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Look this way. Who am I? I am a man. Mortal, finite, subject to every kind of mistake. Flesh and bone like you are. I know all that side of it. But wonder of wonders, glory to God and thank God for redemption. I am also a friend of the bridegroom. And my life and yours is dedicated from this morning on, not to doing what we want done, not to try and wear a coat that's too big for us or too small for us. We're seeking his voice. Through the preaching word, through the inner spirit, we're preaching, we're, we're, we're seeking His guidance, His voice, so that we can leave here saying, in spite of our human limitations, you know something? I am, you can say your name like I said, I am Leslie Hale, the Irish preacher, and all those limitations. We can all leave here saying, on top of all that, I am. Honestly, I am. Shut up, devil, about the condemnation. I know I'm not perfect. It's not dependent on my perfection. It's dependent on his grace. I am a friend of the bridegroom. And what do I do? I listen to his voice. I watch who I'm in spiritually in bed with. And whatever he says, my joy is fulfilled to carry it out. Why? Because I'm a friend of the bridegroom. Let's stand and praise God together, will we, in Jesus' name? Put your hands together. Come on.